Okay, so as Natalie gets ready, um, I'm going to start off with a, a quick kind of hello and welcome, and then just pass it over to Natalie afterwards. So, um, hello everyone, welcome to the first in our Design Thinking Gumbo series for, um, for this semester, the first one in 2021. And this is a series where we share with you a delicious mix of design research methods and tools to help you expand your taste for design thinking and design research. I'm Leslie Ann Noel, and I'm the Associate Director of Design Thinking for Social Impact at the Taylor, Phyllis M. Taylor Center for Social Innovation and Design Thinking. And Design Thinking Gumbo is led by our wonderful Design Thinking um, graduate assistants. And we have five, um, we have six graduate assistants, and today is going to be led by Natalie Hudnick. Um, We'll have several workshops throughout the semester. So we hope that you'll enjoy this one and that you'll come back and have some more gumbo with us. And so I'm gonna just pass it over to Natalie. Thanks, Leslie. So as Leslie said, my name is Natalie Hudnick. I'm a graduate assistant here at Tulane, uh, the Taylor Center here at Tulane. Um, I'm also a second year master of public health candidate at Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, specifically in maternal and child health. And then, so today, uh, our session is about building rapport virtually uh, because the COVID-19 pandemic has created the unique opportunity to explore the application of design thinking methods in a remote and virtual way. So this session in particular, will explore how to build rapport virtually. And I do want to let everyone know that this session will be recorded we'll be taking screenshots to feature on the Taylor website. So to start today, um, I'd like to do a little warm up exercise where we're going to create a virtual empathy circle. So normally this is definitely a lot easier in person trying to create a, an actual circle. But basically how this goes is that uh, one person will start and they'll say something about themselves, like a fun fact or a hobby that they like or a sport team, TV show, almost anything that somebody could possibly connect to or something about yourself that somebody could connect with. And if you have something, the same thing in common with the person who just spoke, you can unmute yourself and say connection. And then the first person to say connection is virtually linked to the original speaker. And then once you've made a connection with somebody, you can do the raised hand emoji or reaction on Zoom that should be at the bottom of your screen um, to display that you are actually linked. And we're gonna do this till everyone is uh, linked and in a virtual circle. So I can start uh, for the group. Uh, so I like to play soccer. Does anyone have something in common with that? I like to watch soccer. Does that count? I think that counts. Yeah. <laughs> and so then you'll go and you'll say something about yourself and then somebody else will go again. Um, well, pre-COVID, I liked to attend concerts. I love going to concerts and I'm so sad that we're not able to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I really like to go for bike rides anyone can relate to that. I own bikes. I don't actually go for bike rides that often, but I'll connect. <laughs> um, let's see, what can I? Like the bikes, um, I have a ton of books on my desk that I have not read, like the bikes that I don't use. So <laughs> I don't know if anyone can connect. I can connect with that. I have loads. <laughs> I keep buying them still. <laughs> um, so something about me. But, um, I love to sing. I can connect with that. <laughs> um, I can't wait till I get the COVID vaccine so I can go and swim. <laughs> Any swimmers? <laughs> um, I, I can connect with that. I used to swim as well as was a waterfront director at a summer camp 
many, many years ago, which is a little scary to say now. Um, and I will share, I actually just got back from walking my, my new puppy that I adopted um, about a month ago. And I don't know if anyone can connect with having a new puppy, but it's a, it's a little tiring <laughs> or connect, connect with being tired. <laughs> I can connect with that. I got a new puppy uh, technically like last, oh my gosh, I, I already forgot when I got her, but she's going to be one next month. She's actually right here looking at me. Here, here's my little puppy, just in case anyone's interested. <laughs> So you have to give us another five. Oh, mine. Um, okay. Ever since COVID started, I have been like very religious about my taco Tuesdays. So I love tacos and I was just eating tacos before I started um, getting on this call. I was gonna say, I can connect to that. We're not doing tacos tonight, but we're doing enchilada casserole. So it's like that Mexican theme. Um, and, I, and I would say um, for me, I have since COVID, I have made a point to get outside and walk, run for at least 30 minutes each day. That's what keeps I can connect, I can connect with that. I can connect with that that I, I'm from Canada and it's becoming beautiful out here. So I just take time out to at least go for a walk every day. Do you have and, another? Yeah, yeah, you're there, yeah, sorry. And, and I know I, and I love books and I've been reading a lot during this COVID. Oh, Leslie, you're muted. No, I'm saying we must have book readers who can <laughs> connect. I'll, I'll connect with that. I love reading books too. I, um, I think I have as many read as unread, so maybe I'm not doing too badly. We're about even there. Um, and I love running too. I know someone's already picked that, but I am, I'm an early riser. So that'll be my fact. And I am up and out in Audubon Park at 4.30 in the morning. And believe it or not, there are other people out there. We have a group of regulars that see each other at 4.30 in the morning in the park. But I'll just say I'm an early riser and I'll leave that out there for someone to connect with or not. I can connect. We sometimes run into each other, Kathy. Um, <laughs> and, and my thing today is that I, I actually ran, I did, um, I think four meetings walking around Audubon Park today instead of running. And it was so pleasant to be out in that weather and instead of sitting behind a computer, but walking around the park, it was amazing. Okay, so uh, are we still, I think we still have some people who haven't connected yet. Uh, Ken, do you have a, a th another fun fact about yourself to try to get a connection with somebody? Um, sure. Fun fact, I dropped out of high school after junior year. No one else dropped out of high school? <laughs> I dropped out of many postgraduate programs, <laughs> but I already connected. So <laughs> maybe someone else did not finish a master's somewhere. I can connect with that. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Grace. I definitely dropped out of a graduate school program. I did that within the first month there um, and knew within two weeks. Uh, and we don't talk about it anymore. <laughs> um, let's see, something, something about oh, myself. Um, even uh, through through the summer, um, I still snuck over to the lake and would jump in and swim. So I 
still managed to do that. Not doing that currently. Um, I am in Chicago. We just got our first warm day of the month. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see, what else can I say? Uh, 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 do we have, do we have a handful of people? Um, let's see, I, I have gotten a lot more new plants. Um, I've propagated a lot of plants. So all of my plants have had plant babies and yeah, that's been going on. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, you guys are tough. <laughs> what A lot else? of the people who connect went already, maybe. <laughs> okay, okay, maybe. I'm seeing people without hand raises, maybe. Oh, we um, leave our hands up, Natalie? Um, if you can, I think, I don't know. It, it was kind of, uh, it was going so well, I kind of forgot about the hand raise a little bit because everybody was <laughs> kind of doing it. So, uh, okay, yeah. I took my hand up. So. <laughs> so can anybody relate to the plant, like loving plants maybe? I feel like we could yes. try to spin this. I feel like there's a lot of people that like plants. Maybe, we, yeah, like Leslie said, we yes. just all connected already. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. I asked. Uh, yeah a tomato that I grew a few weeks ago. So that's connected to the plants as well. I've been growing tomatoes and okra. Um, okra I, I said both of them with a Caribbean accent. I've, 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 grow, I've been growing okra and tomatoes. I did um, not realize okra flowers were so beautiful. Yeah. I saw my first okra flowers this summer. <laughs> They're nice. They're hibiscus actually. I mean, it's the same family. Okay, that makes sense. They look that. Does anyone else have any other connections before we move on to the lecture portion, maybe? Uh, this is Juan. Okay. All right, I think Natalie, it's back to you. Okay, so I guess we'll move forward. This is really fun. I liked getting to know every, a little bit about each other. So we're gonna first start on a little lecture on rapport. Um, I'm gonna give some background on rapport before moving on to general rapport building strategies, both that you could still be using as well as the pre-pandemic strategies, and then eventually talk about new strategies to adapt to rapport building in a pandemic or a virtual environment. So rapport can be defined in many different ways, but I'm gonna define it in a like as a culmination of a few definitions. So I'm gonna define rapport as making a connection, a relationship, a pathway between individuals to serve the purpose of sharing ideas, beliefs, and knowledge, ultimately working to create trust, respect, and reciprocity with each other, and while in a sense, we typically use rapport in some way when we meet people, uh, trying to make friends or just trying to get to know someone in general, rapport itself has professionally been used in the social sciences, specifically anthropology for qualitative research. Anthropologists doing ethnographic research, especially participant observation uh, or interviews use rapport to establish trust, trust with informants. And when doing this research, Establishing rapport can take upwards of months sometimes, but outside of research and academia, you don't really have months to build rapport. Sometimes you have a maximum of a few hours or you're building it over multiple uh, visits with somebody. So why is rapport important? It's important because it helps to establish this trust, empathy, and friendship that are critical for successful collaborations with others. This trust is essential to making sure that the person you are talking to is comfortable to speak to you about their experiences, their lives, and their problems without a fear of judgment. Rapport also helps to elevate the person you are talking with to an expert role, making it known that you care and respect their expertise. Your interviewee or whoever you're talking to is the expert on whatever you are talking about with them, especially in terms of qualitative research, 
So as the interviewer, you want the other person to share their expertise. Now in the pre-pandemic communication and face-to-face -face meetings, when we normally build rapport, both verbal and nonverbal strategies play an important role. For our verbal strategies, the initial small talk before moving on to deeper topics can help to establish the tone of the conversation a little bit like we did earlier in our little in our warm up. So this small talk should be focused on getting the person you are talking to to be more comfortable, especially if you've never met before. So talking about food, the weather, work, or literally anything outside of what the conversation is about can be helpful to break the ice just a little bit before diving into the real purpose of the conversation. Your tone of voice is very important. If you have the wrong tone, like a more authoritative tone when talking to someone, your conversation could come off more as an interrogation. And while listening may not technically be a verbal tactic, actively listening to what the person says can help you find shared experiences with each other. And this can then help you to provide more to the conversation and making it an actual conversation by talking about what that shared experience may be, or if there's more than one, what those may be. So the nonverbal strategies go hand in hand with verbal strategies. You're kind of doing them at the same time. So these strategies typically involve matching or mirroring uh, the nonverbal signals of the person you are talking to. This includes body position, body movements, and facial expressions. Uh, eye contact is key, but some people might not like you making too much eye contact. So kind of just trying to mirror what they're doing a little bit can help to create a sense of comfort for everyone involved instead of creating a barrier between each other. So where does rapport fit into design thinking? Within the design thinking process, which here it's displayed on the slide, empathy is essential to understanding your user, including their needs and problems that help in the development of whatever you want to create. But it's not only empathy for the user, you can also, have, you can also use rapport to have an empathetic relationship with your team to your team members, collaborators, honestly, anyone you're working with. And so, for example, if you are brainstorming with others, you have to build rapport for those connections to have a more successful brainstorming session rather than a bunch of strangers coming in who have no connection. Empathy and rapport ultimately go hand in hand. And in design though, like the real world, uh, rapport happens fast. You don't have months like you do in research, uh, in qualitative research like anthropology or any other social science to establish those uh, connections with others. You might only have hours as most as I was talking about. So how does the pandemic, how has the pandemic affected normal rapport building? So the pandemic has been going on for almost a year now and it's affected almost every way in which we interact, talk with and interview people. Most often interviews and meetings are happening over video call. And if we are in person, we're trying to practice social distancing measures. So that means we are usually talking to people in mass, a little bit of ways away from each other. And we need to figure out how to navigate these new ways of talking to people. For virtual meetings and interviews or for in-person interviews with masks, different rapport strategies are needed to make sure that you can still adapt to this new environment and still work to build the trust and mutual respect between you and the other person. So, but also I wanna make sure the pre-pandemic strategies that I went over that are like the normal rapport building strategies, they still apply. They're just gonna be slightly altered in some ways. So specifically for meeting or interviewing with somebody over video call, keeping, keep your video on. When, you, when your video is on, people can see your face and a better connection is possible. I know firsthand that not having your video on can make you feel a little bit disconnected from the other person, especially if you're the only one who has your video on. Uh, it happens a lot in my breakout rooms in class. Um, or, you know, that's, I feel like we all might've experienced this a little bit sometimes. Um, and then also the energy you have when you're talking to another person can uh, determine the outcome of the interaction. For video calls, you should try to stay calm, get a little bit more attentive and try to match the energy of the other person or have a little bit higher energy. I, I know video call fatigue is extremely real. And if you have low energy or show that you kind of just don't want to be there in the call, the other person may not feel like you care about what they have to say or care about their experiences that they're going to talk about or that they are talking about. 
I know with uh, the pandemic, my work as a graduate assistant has become completely remote. So our group of grad assistants and our team leader, Leslie, consistently meet each week over video call. We all typically have a little bit higher energy than we might normally have. And we also keep our video on and we do small talk as one of our pre-pandemic strategies. We do a lot of small talk before we even start our meeting. And sometimes that goes into like five or 10 minutes before we even get to like what we're actually supposed to start talking about. Um, having, yes, and normally eye contact is important when talking to people, but now I would argue it's a little bit more important than normal. Uh, to you need to try to maintain eye contact as best as possible during video calls. So I know I struggle with this and I'm sure a lot of people do, but usually eye contact means looking at the camera a little bit more and we're a little bit more inclined because that's where it looks like you're actually like making eye contact with somebody. Because I know we look more at the, whatever the video is or the person rather than the actual camera. And so, also, though, trying to maintain that eye contact can help us be free from distractions or multitasking at the same time, uh, like pulling up other things while you're on the video call rather than only focusing directly on what you're talking about with that person. And then mirroring is still just as important. And while you can't see their entire body language or body position in the call, you can see from your shoulders up so you can see their kind of facial expressions they're making and if they're gesturing or um, just body movements in general, you can still see a little bit. So I would try, I would suggest trying to mirror as much as possible, as much as the video screen allows. And lastly for a virtual, uh, one of the last strategies you can do is to share snippets of encouragement or responses, kind of like repeating back to them what they just said or like verbally agreeing to what they're saying or like, yeah, that sounds interesting. Uh, little snippets of words or phrases like that because it show, helps to show the other person you're paying attention that you're actively listening to them. Because if you're just quiet the entire time, people might not think you're actually like paying attention. And then when we're in person or talking or meeting with someone in person, most often, as I was saying before, we are masked now and masks and social distance in general pose a few challenges. Like masks affect the volume of your voice, they hide your facial expressions. And then since we're supposed to be social distancing, you're not able to shake hands or hug people like you might normally do. So your mask voice is something that you should always be working on. Um, our voices are often muffled under the mask. So you might need to speak up and accentuate what you are saying. But make sure you aren't shouting though, but still coming off as a little bit louder than you normally would. And then with face mask hiding our facial expression, we don't get the opportunity for the other person to see us smiling or even having a questioning face or in general, if you don't understand something or if you're confused by what they say. So a little bit to guide that through when you're trying, when you're trying when you want people to see that you're smiling, you could try smiling with your eyes a little bit more or trying to practice that. Um, or also just trying to convey with gestures more so than you normally would uh, that you might convey with your face. I know this is, it's, it's a bit getting too a little creative or you gotta kind of figure it out how you're gonna gesture to explain confusion, but maybe more so with your eyes looking at them like, mm, I don't know if I really understand that, but just trying to make sure you're exaggerating a little bit of your movements to overcome the fact that you have a face mask on. So, and if you are the one doing the talking, you may need to take uh, longer pauses that give time for the other person to respond because they may not be able to tell through your mask if you're taking a pause and speaking or not. Cause sometimes you can tell when you're looking at somebody without a mask, that they're taking a minute to think because sometimes their mask's a little bit open or you can just kind of look in their face that they're like, hmm, I'm gonna think about this for a minute. But taking that longer pause allows for them to be like, okay, maybe I can respond now that they can understand that. And then while we often shake hands or give hugs to the person we may be talking to, proper social distancing makes that almost impossible. So instead offer 
a friendly wave at the beginning and then at the end, it, the wave can still help to set a tone for the meeting or the interview, one that's a more friendly tone than just sitting down and getting right to the conversation. So I just went over a lot, but keep these rapport building strategies in mind as we work through some activities to help us work on building rapport quickly and virtually. And since we are virtual, we won't be able to actively work on building rapport while in a mask, but those strategies are still important if you are to meet and get to know somebody in person. So the following activities today we'll be doing will help us first work on breaking the ice when meeting someone for the first time, and then working to get to the deep conversations that really help you connect and establish rapport. So our first activity is called quarantine expertise. And for this first activity, we want you to talk about what you may have become an expert in over the last year. Some people became good at baking bread, like baking or baking bread, uh, cooking, sewing, painting, et cetera. Literally anything that you think you became an expert in, you can talk about it. And it's okay if you didn't become an expert in anything over the last year. Instead, talk about some what you may already be an expert in uh, before the pandemic and before quarantine even started. Uh, the goal of this activity is to share your expertise and as the interviewer emphasize that you want to understand the other person's expertise. So we're gonna put you into breakout rooms and you'll each have three minutes to discuss what you are an expert in and be interviewed about that expertise. So it will be three minutes per person and there'll be two people in each breakout room. And so uh, remember the techniques I went over, video on, eye contact, mirror body movement positioning as much as the video allows, stay attentive, a little higher energy. And uh, after, after the breakout room time is done, prepare to share out your experiences. Um, at least one person from each group should be prepared to share. Is there any questions about the activity? No questions. Okay, awesome. Uh, Naisha, do we have those breakout rooms ready? Yep, I just opened them all. So everybody should get like a notification to join your breakout room. All right, it looks like they're all back. All right, welcome back everyone. Um, so I, let's just do a little debrief about your experience in, with this activity. Does anybody want to describe their experience or how, how their breakout room went? Hello. Um, so Kathy and I were in the same breakout room and it was really fun getting to know Kathy. And I was kind of thinking, um, you know, we both learned a lot of different things over the course of, the, of quarantine. But one thing I was kind of like thinking about was like, it seemed very easy because it was just one-on-one, -on -one. but then if they're like all of us, <laughs> how does that feel in terms of the communicative strategies? You know, like, so it, was, it, it felt really natural, but I don't think like ordinarily I would feel that way if it's like a larger group, so. <laughs> Did anyone else? That was a good, I that was a really good thing you brought up because I feel like sometimes when we have these bigger groups, we're less likely to want to be like, to do even just a little bit icebreaker. It feels a little bit awkward, a lot more than it would be if it was a one-on-one. -on -one. I'll connect with that, Glenda. In, uh, in larger groups, I'm like, oh, <laughs> does the same strategies apply? They do, but I'm not always the one to definitely speak up. But uh, I had a wonderful conversation with Alicia. Uh, she was running around her home trying to keep her dog, uh, her new puppy <laughs> taken care of. Um, but that was one of the things that we talked about was really trying to be um, keeping that life balance of all these different things because I had mentioned that I'm not really an expert but I've gotten better at like being flexible throughout this past year um, and I've really given myself some grace with that so uh, we had a really great discussion about all different types of things so I, I loved it. <laughs> so, any other thoughts about your experience or your breakout room? I can share a bit. Um, so I chatted with Nicola and we had so many things in common. 
um, which I think is, and, and we weren't looking for the things that we had in common, but I think, you know, whenever you're building rapport or, you know, if you're thinking about empathy, finding those things in common, just make, um, make things happen quick, much more quickly. So, you know, we were interested in the same area of study and plants and the Caribbean and, and stuff like that. So yeah, we had a lot of similarities that made our rapport, um, made us connect very quickly. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. I think like, I don't know if I went, I can't remember if I went over that or not, but like having those shared experiences and commonalities is something that doesn't always happen, but once it does, it, you definitely build rapport much quickly, much more quickly than you would if you didn't have any of those shared commonalities. Okay, so for our next activity, we're, it, we actually borrowed this from one of Leslie's classes uh, here. So Leslie, could you tell us a little bit about how you did this activity? Where it's about creating a two minute movie, but this is obviously we're not creating an actual movie, but yeah, Leslie, could you describe how you did this in your class a little bit before I go into more detail? Okay, um, so our students had to interview residents of New Orleans to, um, to understand an, an issue from their perspective. And um, I also knew a filmmaker, um, she actually lived in Lafayette, I think, and she came to our class to help the students understand empathy better. And what the filmmaker was trying to tell us, um, you know, when, when the students first did the interviews, the filmmaker came in and listened to the students' interviews. And then she said that, okay, but you actually haven't gotten enough information to create a nice movie about these people or, you, you know, and, and in the way she was asking the questions, she was challenging them to go deeper with the interviews so that they would really connect, really draw out some information that would give some, create some kind of emotional response from other people. And by her asking them to make the movie or to pretend they were making the movie, but they actually had to make the movie. But by her setting things up like that, the students actually, when they did the interviews a second time, they really were less transactional and we're trying to get much closer to the people that they were interviewing so that they could do this movie well. Yeah, so building off that, trying to make interviews less transactional or just meeting people less about like what you can gain from somebody uh, in that mindset, we're, we're going to be back into your same breakout room and you're gonna be trying to do basically what Leslie's class did and create a two minute movie that you find information about this other person and their experiences that you would incorporate into a two minute movie about that person. And so the whole point is to get into deep conversation and to get to understand their life intimately enough to create this movie that it will draw out so many emotions for whoever would watch it if it were to actually get made. And so what I want you guys to go into thinking about this and when you go into your breakout rooms is how would you go about interviewing to understand this person's life enough to describe a short movie about their experiences, about their expertise? How are you going to interview them in that way to get that? So in that mindset, we'll send you back into your breakout room. Uh, keep in mind all the rapport techniques I went over for virtual rapport building as, regu regular, as, regu as regular rapport building pre-pandemic. And then you're welcome to take notes if you want to, you don't have to. And then, yeah, be prepared to share out your experience in the, out when you're done out of the breakout room. And you'll have about five, roughly five minutes each person to do an interview with each other. Any questions? Okay, I guess, uh, Naisha, I guess we'll send everybody back into breakout rooms. Yep, everyone should have got their invite to go back into their breakout rooms. All right, hey. looks like everyone's back. Awesome, welcome back everyone. So I just kind of want to debrief uh, about your experience in your breakout room or how you went about interviewing. Does anybody want to start sharing their experiences that they had? I can share mine a little bit. Um, yeah. I think I found it quite hard actually, actually thinking about it as a movie rather than necessarily just having, like I think sometimes when I do interviews, I tend to do it, be a bit more conversational, but maybe it's the time frame as well that we had. But I found that quite hard to sort of 
necessarily steer it towards particular type of information whereas actually just the conversation that I think we were having was in itself interesting and I think oh. so yeah I, I found that a bit quite hard actually to ask in, that, in that sense but maybe as well because we didn't have kind of time to think of questions before and what the movie what, what yeah the movie. it's def definitely like normally I feel like if you might do this you might come up with questions beforehand mm -hmm. and then that's a little bit easier but then some other times you just don't you don't have those questions beforehand and mm -hmm. then you gotta figure it out so yeah yeah, anybody else have a similar experience? Or how did they find their breakout room? Like, I was just going to say, I really just enjoyed the conversation. Um, and it was like an easy flow of communication with Grace. And it was interesting to get to know a little bit more quickly about her life. And I feel like that I could do a two minute movie, right? <laughs> An overview now. So. It, it was very interesting. I, I liked doing that. So thanks, Grace. Awesome. For <laughs> I would say uh, in this whole process, you just like kind of sometimes when you're on the screen and we all are from different part of the world, it's interesting to see that the person on the other side is also like me. So that was yeah. interesting. That, oh, okay. There are certain similarities, which is interesting. How come this person on the other side, I never met this person, but how come some stories are similar? So it's like kind of, we might think that, oh, we are in a very unique situation. This is my life and this is my whatever that my thing is. But like, no, if you take a mean on a probability curve, we are in the center. So it's, it's, we are not in the extremes. We mostly are connected in some other ways, which is interesting to know about the other person. Oh, yeah, that's like a great way to put it that we're all we all have some sort of connection and I and I really like how you put that. Any other thoughts about their experience? Uh, if you hadn't done the first activity with the same person, how do you think it would have gone? Like you had a little breaking the ice with the person in the first activity that you were in the same breakout room. And if you didn't have that person and you had a completely different person, how would that have changed your experience? you think does anybody have a comment to that would have gone downhill no <laughs> <laughs> no um Cassie and I got into like some really like deep personal stuff and there was no way that we could have arrived at that place if there weren't if we didn't have the first activity <laughs> Does anyone else have any comments about yeah. that? Yeah, I don't oh, sorry, think go I ahead. Dove, you're fine. I don't think I would have dove like head straight into everything, especially with the time constraint. Um, if I didn't know like Alicia prior to that. So I think it was helpful to just kind of unpack immediately, or at least within the first few moments, rather than again building in that rapport and icebreaker first and then going into some more discussion. I would like to add that I think actually somehow being on screen with one another um, and I think maybe because of the topic, um, coming in and sort of being vulnerable and being able to feel intimately connected um, and sharing space together and hear like really deeply listening to one another, this, I mean, to be able to do that in just a few minutes is pretty tough but like we definitely were able to do that and you know I think from the way that all of this has built to this point has allowed all of that and like everybody has been like very participatory um and so I think that's certainly added to to that but there's something about this sort of screen closeness that I think allows you to really be much more vulnerable and want to be that way yeah. Oh, that, that was great how you put that. And I think everyone that I think Glenda, how you described it, as well as uh, I think it was Chelsea. Uh, yeah, you guys kind of hit the nail on the head when I was kind of hoping you would get out of this and that if you didn't do that this initial small talk or icebreaker, you weren't going to be able to get into those deep conversations and emphasizing rapport building as it's mul there's, mul there's multiple steps to it. And you can't just, it's very difficult to get right away into the deep conversation. And even if you had trouble, 
that's still part of it because sometimes it does you can't get into the deep stuff within five minutes of having a conversation you definitely need longer sometimes and so I'm glad we like ended this little conversation like this uh debrief on that note because it's kind of emphasizing that rapport building can happen quickly or it can happen a little bit longer than what you might think um and so the goal was to show you how to get past that awkwardness that may come with talking to someone for the first time and then working into having more intimate conversations to create that trust, respect, and ultimate connection that is part of rapport. So it's not easy to build and it can honestly make or break whether or not you will have a good relationship with that person you are speaking to and whether they feel comfortable enough to talk to you. Um, does anybody have any final thoughts or questions that they'd like to, or things they'd like to add right now? Glenda has her hand raised. Yeah, there's one thing that I, I you know, like I usually have um, used Teams. And so the way that the interface, at least, I don't know if it's something in my settings is set up, like I could see Kathy and then me. So we're both, um, you know, it's like both there, but on Teams it's different. And so I was, you know, from the, from the first session, I was like, oh, the, the, the layout of the, how the screen or whatever is looking, I think was influencing my sense of intimacy with the person I was talking to because I definitely don't have that feeling when I use Teams. And this yeah. was the first time that I was using Zoom with a person one-on-one. -on -one. Usually when it's Zoom, it's like everyone in the gallery and all the faces, right? So I think that um, design element of how it was set up, uh, you know, across um, applications really had an influence on how I felt the interaction unfolded. So I just wanted to like throw that in. Yeah, that's really interesting. Was it your comment? You uh, you like unmuted it. <laughs> No, no, no. I was just thinking, yeah, that's very interesting. And, and, and actually, like, I was going to send Natalie a message just now to, to, um, to I'll say it now. Um, if you stop sharing screen now, also, it creates like a different, um, a, a, I don't know if it's better or worse than Teams, but, you, you know, like when I'm, I'm in meetings, um, sometimes I'll be having like that kind of conversation with the other person in the background where we're saying, okay, do we share now or do we not share? Or, you know, like um, I've, I've done like panel discussions and, you know, they'll say things like, okay, so before you start sharing your screen, make sure and talk to the audience for a long time so that they can all see your face and then start sharing. So that's, um, you know, Glenda, that was a good call to bring out the design part of it. You know, how do we create this rapport during design? Um, well, I'm gonna add a, like another 30 seconds thing. My students have some interviews to do with seniors on Thursday and none of these seniors use Zoom. And so like we're pulling our hair out about how do we build this rapport when they can't see each other. Um, we're going to do it. We're, we're going to have these phone call interviews, but um, yeah, without the faces. And we're thinking that maybe without the faces, it will actually create a different type of, again, vulnerability, et cetera. Leslie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to your 30 seconds and say that Alicia and I actually did talk about that, that just no facial thing and just how her students had to do phone calls with people and that removed any of their biases because they could not even see people. So that was almost helpful for them to be more vulnerable because they, they did not have mm -hmm. any of those barriers or biases of the people that they were talking to. And I found that very interesting because of, of course, we've moved in and out of phone calls, no phone calls, now we're on Zoom. So it's, it's very interesting to see how that progresses. Oh, that's nice. Yes. All right, Natalie. I would just like to add that I actually also, oh. No, go ahead, Grace. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, I was just going to say, I, I actually think that um, being able to hear but not see, you, you have to do deeper listening um, and you can really actually hear, you can hear clearer. Um, and, and I think that it, it, I actually, I think that's a great way to connect and, and think um, more deeply uh, and not be distracted by, you know, seeing yourself on a screen or trying to figure out where to look and you can really focus on the topic at hand. 
Yeah. Well, thank you guys for coming. I, this is a great conversation that we just had. Um, and I know we went a little over time, but I'm glad that every, as much people could stay on as possible, as long as possible. So thank you again for coming. And I really, I hope you were able to get some valuable information, strategies out of this workshop. Um, and then you can find more resources about the Taylor Center at taylor.tulane.edu. And we also have a design thinking breakfast coming up this Friday. Naisha, would you like to talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, hi everyone. I just dropped the link for you all to register for our design thinking breakfast. Um, this Friday, it's at 8 a.m. So it's a little bit early, but you can bring your coffee. PJs are also welcome. If you do not want to get dressed, you're totally fine with that. Um, as long as you have on like a shirt. Um, <laughs> but um, we'll be talking about um, like self-care and designing for ourselves. It'll be really interesting. Yes, awesome. and I will be led by Louis Montoya, who's um, who's a designer at the D School at Stanford, and he's um, he focuses on equity in his work, and he's just like a really fun guy. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So that's the end of the workshop. Thank you again for coming, <laughs> um, and thank you again for staying on a little bit longer. So yeah. It was nice meeting everyone and I'm glad you all came. <laughs>